This is part two of the why we worship, why we praise. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, let's all um, turn there if you like. I'm sure our, our audio-visual guys will, will get that there for you as well. But it reads there, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Aren't you glad about that? Amen. He's not like us. We, we change our mind like we change our clothes. You know, one day we're, I'm, I'm with you, I love you, Gee, I'll do anything, I'm with you. And then the next day, oh, they hurt my feelings. I'm not with you no more. But Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So do not be attracted by strange new ideals. Your spiritual strength comes from God's special favor, not from ceremonial rules about food, which don't help those who follow them. We have an altar for which the priest in the temple on the earth have no right to eat. Under the system of the Jewish laws, the high priest brought the blood of animals into the holy place as a sacrifice for sin. But the bodies of the animals were burnt down the outside of the camp. So also Jesus suffered and died outside the city gates in order to make his people holy by shedding his own blood. So let us go out to him outside the camp and bear the disgrace he bore. For this world is not our home. We are looking forward to our city in heaven, which is yet to come. With Jesus' help, let us continually offer our sacrifice of praise to God by proclaiming the glory of his name. We talked last week, and I'll give you a brief review, that the Old Testament, the way they would sacrifice was, was very burdensome. Imagine having to raise animals, and in those animals having to separate those that were worthy of sacrifice, and, and then killing them. And then once you've, you've, you've slaughtered them, you, you take the, the meat and the flesh, and you would burn that on the outside. But the blood was very special. And it would, would be presented to God Jehovah as, a, as an offering for our sin. Now, if we had to do that today, every one of us wouldn't be here because we'd be too busy hunting down another animal. Huh? And, and if we had to do that every day, uh, I think we'd run out of animals. Hello, someone. <laughs> the tabernacle, as they came, it was a symbol uh, of God's presence. It was symbolic. So when they seen the tabernacle, that's what the, represented to them uh, uh, the presence of God. And, and in the Old Testament, as you read it, and sometimes people don't understand, there were, there were two major temples or tabernacles that were constructed in the Old Testament. You had the one constructed by Moses, but you also had another one constructed by Solomon. And although they were both uh, uh, temples that were for the Hebrew people, they had completely different styles of worship. The tabernacle of Moses was situated on Mount Gibeon, and it contained three sections, the outer court, the inner court, and the Holy of Holies. And that place was a place of very somber worship, with no singing in their worship. Worship was based mainly on the laws that they read and their works. They would have to bring these sacrifices continually, continually, and do things for the, for the tabernacle or the temple. Well, the other church, if you will, of that day was the tabernacle of David. And then he, he was, that tabernacle was situated in Mount Zion. And remember I said the, the, the northern tribe was Moses. They were the Norteños. Right? And the southern tribe was David. He was the Sudeños, right? Is that what I said, right? Yeah. And that's where, you know, you, you, you look at that and you go, wow. And like I said, that was the first time that the Norteños actually outnumbered the Sudeños. It was 10 to 2, amen? It's not like that anymore. But let me move on to the, to the sermon. The tabernacle of David was situated in Mount Zion, and it contained only one area. It was a big courtyard, much like this church is this morning. And it was based on grace and faith. Both forms of worship, they existed at the same time, and, and they, they were, weren't happy with each other. Mount Gibeon, like I said, was northern. Mount Zion was the southern. But here's the difference at that time. It was a southern 
portion uh, or, or, or King David who had the Ark of the Covenant. There was a story where King David was dancing because they finally had the Ark and they were bringing it home and they were having a good time because David, and that's when his wife got embarrassed because what it said that he was dancing in his loincloth. That would be like if one of us began to dance in our underwear. Now what would my wife think if I started right now to take off all my clothes and started dancing in my underwear? First she come up there and slap me you know what I mean? So, and so you can understand, you, you kind of feel bad for, for, for David's wife, you know, because you can understand why she's like, what is wrong with you? But David just got lost in, in his worship of God. He forgot what he was doing. Uh, good thing he had uh, grace and, and faith there, amen? But in that type of temple, there were sacrifices of joy, Song, dance, laughter, clapping, music. They had the band. Remember we talked about they had 200 trumpets. Remember that? Wow. Blowing away. Both forms of worship were, were, were relevant. However, it was that, that Southern had had the Ark of the Covenant that actually had the presence of God. And, this, and I didn't mention this last year, last week rather, but they had the Ark, the presence of God. But the other ritual, the other church continued to exist. So what what happened is because they lacked the presence of God, their, their rituals that at one time had God's presence became a form of religion. See, that, that it's very distinct. When, when you don't have the presence of God, I don't care which church you go to. If you go to Victor Outreach, if you don't have the presence of God, my friend, then all you have is religion. You know, we try to blame other, other denominations, other, other places. No, no, no. It's not the, the denomination that lacks the presence of God. It's the person that goes there. Because they bring their presence. Amen? So that can happen anywhere. My, my, my desire is that everybody here understands and they carry the presence of God with them. Because that's where the president, that's where he lies. That's where he should be. Amen? So we bring together, we come together as a community, as a family, and we bring the presence of God to the church. If the presence of God is not in the church, it's because you forgot to bring him. So quit blaming me. I'm doing the best I can. Hmm? Let's move on. It's that God inhabits the praise of, of his people. And what does God inhabit? The praise of his people. He inhabits your praise. So if you fail to praise, if you're here, come, come to church this morning, you're all bum kicked and you don't want to sing, you don't want to raise your hand, then listen, you're hindering God's presence. You're not bringing it in. Uh, we all have problems. I got problems. You might be my problem. I might be your problem. But it doesn't matter, man. You still got to praise the Lord. Because in that praise, it's in that praise where God's presence comes. And when God's presence arrives, your problems seem to shrink away. Yeah. Hmm? See, praise is, is a sacrifice because it does four things for us. We talked about that. When you begin to praise first, we engage the enemy in spiritual warfare. I've had people call me oftentimes, uh, Pastor, uh, I, there's something happening, there's a spirit, or uh, I think there's a demon in this house. I go, you got a radio? You got some tape? You got some worship music? Yeah, put it on. Why? Why? Just put it on. Don't ask me why. Just go put it on and come back on the phone. They put it on. Now we got the enemy at bay. Because the devil cannot handle worship. He cannot handle praise. All he wants to do is paralyze you. So that he can take advantage of you. So when you begin to praise and worship, you engage the enemy in spiritual warfare. After you do that, we enter into the very throne room of God. As you praise, then you get closer and closer to God. And like I said earlier, but be careful, because the closer you get to God, the worse you look. Huh? Remember, God's a big, bright light. In the dark, you might look fine like wine. But when the light comes on, you look like vinegar. Hello, somebody. But that's what praise will do to you. I think that's why some people don't want to praise. They praise, they start worshiping God, they start feeling God, and then they realize how messed up they are. Let me move on. The third thing it does when you praise, we confess the truth in a world full of lies. It's hard to keep lying when you're worshiping God. You can't do it. You know, and you can tell when Christians are, have a hard time praising and worshiping, you go, uh-oh. They're up to something. Because that, see, praising and worshiping for a Christian is like drinking a bottle for a baby. You don't have to teach a baby to drink a bottle. They just know how to do it. They come up. Looking for stuff, you know what I mean? They did that. Who taught them that? Nobody taught them that. They didn't come out. Right? 
That's how Christians are. When you come out, you come out of that womb, that spiritual womb. You come out looking for stuff. You come out praising. If you don't come out praising, then I don't know if you were born. Let me move on. Number four. When you praise and worship, we connect with all of heaven's resources. Huh? When you begin to praise and worship. Really praise and worship. Now you have God's resource at your hand. Huh? And that, that's when people don't they'll come to the pastor and say, Pastor, what do I need to do? You, you, you come telling me what you're doing. Because you have the resource. They're like, wow, that's a pretty good one. I like that idea. I like that one. Uh, can I use that? Because now you're, you're, you're using the resources that you have at your command. But you don't only get it when you're really praising. You only get it when, you, when you're not living in that world full of lies. You only get it when you see yourself and you begin to repent. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just being very religious. No presence of God. But you got the religion down. Yep. Right? Yep. Oh, we don't want that. Right. No. We want the presence of God. Amen. See, New Testament sacrifice. Now, that's the Old Testament sacrifice. The, the, the animals and King David and Moses. But the New Testament sacrifice, it's a little different. It's Jesus. So the sacrifice of Jesus, and like I shared last week when I was in the prison there in, in Cape Town, South Africa, talking to the Koza tribemen, right? And, and I got their attention by talking about animal sacrifices because that's what they did. They continue to, to do that to this day. They, they, they sacrifice animals to their gods. And as I begin to talk about the animal sacrifice, I, I, I brought them into the ultimate sacrifice. I brought them to Jesus. And then I begin to say that you don't have to sacrifice those animals anymore because that's why Jesus came. Jesus was crucified and sacrificed outside the city. There. Huh? Nothing but our lack of worship can keep us from Jesus' presence. So when Jesus died for our sins, three things happened. The first thing is that Jesus fulfilled the law of God. Hmm? The law of, of God. Man is, man is sinful, and there must be a sacrifice to atone for the sin of man. There's no way around it. Of our own volition, of our own strength, there's nothing you can do to atone for the sin. So that was it. He had to do this. He fulfilled the law of God. In the Old Testament, it was animals, but today it was Jesus. So you don't, you, we're not asking you to sacrifice of your fleshly body or, uh, like Jesus, but, but we are asking you to sacrifice, and I'll talk about that more later. But in John 1, 29, it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why did he say that? Because John was relating that Jesus was going to be that type of animal sacrifice but a sacrifice once and for all. It was over. He didn't call him the Messiah. He said, the Lamb of God. Because why? Because for the sin to be fulfilled, in the Old Testament, they had to bring a, a, a lamb without spot, without blemish, without wrinkle to the sacrifice. John recognized that that was the Lamb of God. That was the sacrifice. See, everything we could ever do for salvation is already done. I remember I heard Willie G say one time that, you know, we won the war. All we are is like the janitor. We're just sweeping up. It's over. The battle's done. There's nothing more you can do for your salvation. And, and when we talk about getting involved and doing things, it's not about uh, uh, to complete your salvation. If you've accepted Christ in your heart, then my friend, you're saved. You're on the way to heaven. Shout in victory. We're not talking about that. When we say we need your help, we need your involvement, it's not for your salvation. My goodness, we're not that selfish. It's for the salvation of others. We say, okay, you got the goods, huh? You got the hookup. Don't you want somebody else to get it? And the only way it can happen is if you help us and we do it together. Because hmm? the sacrifice was done. When Jesus died on the cross, there was no more need for a high priest or a sacrifice. So then why did the Hebrew writer talk about, and he said, a sacrifice of praise? So how do we sacrifice for, to God? If, if, if all the sacrifice is done, we don't offer, or we don't kill an animal to offer the blood to, to God. So what kind of sacrifice do we bring when we come to church? Huh? And, and the song, we bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. That's an old school, right? We bring a sacrifice of praise. Why? And we, we sing this. Sometimes we just, why do we sing this? Be, because we're, we're, we're called to praise him. Huh? 
uh, offerings, all these were called, like uh, Prius said, even the offering, that's a, that's, a, that's a form of praise and worship. Because really, huh? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You can look, you know, like a duck. Huh? You can walk like a duck. You can even quack like a duck. But if you ain't praising him with everything, your whole substance, you're not a duck. You're just nothing but a turkey. Hello. Any turkeys in the house? Don't raise your hand. Huh. See, when they saw, offered a sacrifice on the altar in the Old Testament, it said the smoke would ascend to heaven. The Bible says a sweet smell would ascend to heaven, and God would, would recognize uh, the offering. Your sacrifice of praise is the same way. It makes its way up to God. God hears your words of praise validated by your acts of service. Because you could talk, you know, a lot of people could talk long neck. You know, they, people talk, you know, some people are good at talking neck. They talk neck on both sides of their head. And they're just always talking neck. They're like this, you know, you're, wow, they look good. But see, God doesn't look at that. He, he hears it. But he quantifies it by what your actions. That's why I want to go through the book of James. Why? Because James says, hey, you have faith, uh, but I I'll show you my faith by what I do. Mm. Praise, sacrifice, offering. And it's very simple. Say, God, how am I doing with you? You don't even have to ask God that. Just look in the mirror and say, God, how am I praising you? What am I doing for you? And really begin to evaluate what you're doing. If you're doing stuff. Hmm. The Bible says that we are to offer a sweet-smelling savor to his nostrils. Your sacrifice of praise, if you're praising, God will hear what you say. And that is the fulfillment of the law. Because you're praising. Jesus, he removed the barrier from God. I, I, I called it, I used that analogy years ago. I'll do it again. Because huh? there's no longer any curtain. You, the temple had a big curtain. And the Bible says it was ripped but when Jesus died, not only was it the temple ripped, it said that the earth shook. The sun was blackened out, right? The stone rolled away. It was a, I call it, it was a major takeover. It was a coup. The devil didn't know. The devil was in control. He was in, he was in charge. He thought he won. But, the, but Jesus did a coup. He went down to hell, took the, key, the keys right, of death from the enemy, and he, and he did a coup. It was like, like I said, it was like a, a Michael Colleone when he took over. If you know the Godfather, I love the Godfather, my favorite movie. He came in when he took over, he was baptizing the baby. Right? But while that was happening, all of his enemies were being dealt with. And he became the Godfather, right? And that's what Jesus did. He came in, he was, he was, he, they thought he'd lost. He went down to heaven. And while that was happening, the earth recognized it. It shook. The stone was rolling. The sun recognized it because it got blacked out. The religion of that time, the power of that time recognized it because God ripped it over. It was a coup. He took over. That was the power that happened. Jesus removed the barrier from God. Now listen, this is a tr tricky part. Because everyone says, well, I just mean God. There's no barrier. And this is true. There is no barrier other than the one you put. So nothing can separate you from the love of God. And we're not talking about God being separated from you. What we do is we separate ourselves from God. And the only barrier that exists is you. The devil can't do it. Huh? Your mother-in-law can't make you. No one can do it but you. See, so Jesus removed the barrier. And when you say, I, I, I can't get a hold of God, I, I can't grab a hold of him, then there's something in your life that is keeping you from it. Because you're the only barrier to God. Yeah. One way to break down that barrier is to praise him. But I don't feel like praising him, Pastor. Uh, so? Because sometimes I don't feel like talking to you, but I talk. Well, <laughs> well I don't, you know, I, I'm going through all this stuff. And now, so? I go through a lot of stuff. Uh, everybody goes, goes through stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you still go to work? Well, if you can still go to work, can't you, can't you still praise them? Come on, see, see how easily we're, we're, we're sidetracked. We'll do all these other things despite how we feel. But when it comes to praising and doing what God asks us, never demands, when he asks us, we say, oh, I can't do it. I'm going through it. I'd rather go home and suck my thumb. Huh? Matthew 27, 50 reads, Jesus shouted out again and he gave up his spirit. 
at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. We don't need a high priest, but we do need help. Huh? Hey, when I first got saved, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. All I knew was, God, I don't want to stab nobody. Huh? I don't want to do drugs no more. I want to be, be a good person, so I came to church. That was about it. Somebody told me Jesus can help me. Prove it. And that was it. Prove it. Because if he don't help me, you're in trouble. Because I know where you live now. <laughs> Done seen all the good you had in your pad. You know, uh, oh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Nobody thought like that, just me, right? I said, God, I need some help. This guy needs help. And as I went for help and kept coming and kept praising him and kept worshiping him and kept reading the Bible, God helped me. So, God, God, listen, if you're coming for help, God's not going to go, boom, you are new. <laughs> Ding, bright teeth, white teeth, no. It's not going to happen. You're still going to have yellow teeth. <laughs> you're, you, you still gonna, might be overweight and sloppy. It doesn't matter. But he's going to help you. He's not going to change you. Boing. No, it's not going to happen like that. He's going to help you. He's going to say, you know what you need to do? What? Pray. Pray? You mean I have to do something? Yeah, pray. Yeah. Gosh, God, I just wanted help. Well, go pray. Well, what else? Get a, get a Bible. You, got, you know that one? Blow all the dust off. <laughs> and read it. Read it? You mean I got to read? I don't hate to read. You want help? Yeah. Well, go read that Bible that your grandmother gave you 20 years ago. Go read it. Huh? Oh, yeah, there's a church. Victor Rogers, go to church. Be faithful every Sunday morning. Faithful? Faithful? It's a very simple things, but we want boom, help. Thank you, Lord. I'm better. No, you only feel that for a moment when you get loaded. Then it goes away. You might feel better for about that much. That's it. But that, the hangover comes or the pimples start popping. Hello, somebody. Let me move on before I get too deep on that one. Hmm. No. So we are a chosen people, the Bible says, a royal priest, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. That you, this is why, not just because we could be Victor Arich, we are Victor Arich, couldn't be prouder if you can't hear me, tough. You know, we're not like that. No, we are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, because we are called to praise God, to praise him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's why we're a holy nation. That's why we are a royal priesthood. And if we're not praising him for bringing us out of the darkness, if we're not praising him, then what good is it? To what, what good is it? To keep it to ourselves? So every one of us can come into his presence and have an audience with God because God wants you to have that audience. Third thing Jesus did, he provided for us intimacy with God. That word intimacy, when you look in the Old Testament, it's yada. Intimacy is like the, a man and a woman having intimacy. There's a deep connection. And I'm not talking the sexual act. I'm talking a deep, in, intimate relationship between a man and a woman beyond that. When you're young, that's all you think about. And that means nothing. We're talking about intimacy where, where the man understands his woman and the woman understands his man, where the man cherishes his wife and, 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 and the woman adores her husband. Now, intimacy is taking place. That other stuff is just animal stuff. Huh? And God is talking about, I want you to have intimacy with me, where you understand me and I understand you. When you hurt, I hurt. And when I hurt, you hurt. Now we're in intimacy. See, and God does that from the beginning. And his whole book, if you read this book, and I, I call this God's blind date. When you read this book, God has been trying for thousands of years to introduce himself to everybody. He wrote every detail. He comes to us and he introduces himself uh, through, as a creator. And he used Adam and he began to create things. And so he would introduce to us who he was, becoming intimate, because God is a creator. And he continues his, his introduction to us. And he introduces himself to us as a, as a, as a God of judgment. And we, we see Noah, when the world began to defy God and curse God and turn their back on God. There was Noah. He said, Noah, I found one that I found favored. He goes, Noah, get your family. Build an ark. And he says, what the heck is an ark? He says, just build it and be quiet. And he built the ark. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce myself to the world as a God of judgment. And he began to judge the world, continuing the intimacy with us. 
Uh, he goes on through the ages and he finds a man named Abraham out of the land of the Chaldeans, which is modern day Iraq. He's there and he says, Abraham, actually he called his dad first, but his dad gave up. He settled, but he goes, Abraham. Abraham, come out and do this. And Abraham believed him. And because he believed and he just did it without asking questions, he's the father of faith. Because God wants us to understand that he is a God of faith. He's not going to give you all the answers. He's going to tell you, walk that way. And we say, I'll walk that way, but tell me where I'm going. He said, no, just start going. And when you get there, I'll let you know you arrived. So we don't like that. We want an itinerary. No, but God is introducing himself to us. He's trying to, be, he's trying to get you to know. We, we talk about, I want the veil. I want to get to know God. Well, what are you waiting for? He's a God of creation. He's a God of judgment. He's a God of faith. Then he moves on, and he uses another young man by the name of Joseph, who was crucified, almost crucified by his, with his brothers, thrown into a pit to die, sold into slavery, put into prison for nothing but being a good guy, accused of raping his boss's wife. Huh? Just to be raised to the top level. Huh? The top level of his government. And did he hold it against people? Did he say, I told you I was a bad dude. Ha ha. Did he try to get all proud and say, hey, my name is Joseph. He care. <laughs> no, he kept himself humble. He said, you might have meant it for evil. His brothers were weeping, knowing what they did to him. He goes, no, it's okay. You might have meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Huh? Because why God wanted to understand that everything he does is, is for his purpose. It's not for your pleasure. If he did it for pleasure, Moses would have, I mean, uh, Joseph would have never went to prison. If he did it for pleasure, Joseph would have been thrown into the pit. But sometimes for God's purpose, you need to go in the pit. You need to be persecuted. You need to go through a few things because God has a purpose. Yes. It's not about us. It's about him. Yes. Yes. It's about him. So God continues this process. Why? And we're, we, we should get to know him because we're praising him. And as we praise him, he takes us to these levels. And he shows you who he, am, he is because he wants to get intimate with you. Do you really want to get intimate with him? And then he moves to this man, Moses. Because prior to this, they didn't have these temples. They didn't have uh, the Holy of Holies. They didn't, understand, they didn't have any of that. He sees Moses. He brings Moses out. out. Why? Because he wants to introduce to us who he is. He's a God of power and glory. Because through Moses' life, we see God's glory. His glory was so great that when he just passed by Moses, the afterglow of Moses couldn't be seen by the people. A God of glory, his power, able to set at liberty millions of people by the words that he spoke. Power. And lastly, as we come to the final sacrifice, he introduces us to Jesus. See, he's introducing himself through Jesus. And when you think of Jesus, we can talk about salvation and all that stuff, and that's true. But when I see Jesus, it's God showing us his goodness. That's why when they came up to him, he goes, good master. And Jesus says, hey, who are you calling good? There is only one good, and that is God. Hmm? So I was talking about intimacy, praising him. And you don't get that. I'm telling you, you might get it in your head, but I don't want it in your head. I want it to get to your head, from your head to your heart, so you really understand it. And there's only one way to have that done. There's only one way to happen. You have to begin to really worship the Lord with your life, with all you have. You have to really, truly praise him with everything you got. If you don't do that, don't expect to truly understand what I'm trying to tell you. It's got to get deep in you. It's got to be something that you want. Something that you want more than anything. Stop looking at your friends, your neighbors, for the lack of what they're not doing. They're, they're supposed to let you down. Don't be surprised by that. That has nothing to do with God and what you're called to do. Stop looking at your husband that he's not the man of God that you're supposed to, you, to, supposed to be. Rather, Don't worry about that because you're probably not the woman of God you're supposed to be. Just do what God called you to do. Focus on your relationship with God. And you watch. As you get better, things around you will get better. As you improve, your, your, your outlook on life will get better. As you begin to focus on the things of God, you're not going to focus on the frailties and, and all the sin that are, that are drenched in, drenching people, especially in church. You're not going to look at that. My goodness, if we just looked around at how messed up we all are, we'd be messed up. We're not called to look at each other. We're called to look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. That's what we're called to look on. That's praising him. 
Because no matter how ugly your neighbor is, no matter how stupid your husband is, no matter how dumb your wife may be, Jesus died for them. Hello? Jesus died for them. So as long as we praise God, we don't worry about that. We just keep doing what God calls us to do. Because he has a purpose. He has a plan. So today, ours is a sacrifice of praise. Hebrews 13, 15 says, Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. Praise him. Thank him. Ran out of gas. Praise the Lord. Don't start looking for somebody to yell at. Huh? Man, I ain't got enough check for the week. Praise God. At least you're alive to live a week. Thank you, Jesus. Hmm? Oh, I don't care how, how gloom your life may be. It could be worse. Huh? Thank God. Hey, look, we're in the United States of America. You know, we talk about poor folk, right? We have poor folk in, in America, right? But it's amazing. America is the only country where poor folk still get fat. I, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I've been to Asia, been to, been to Europe, been to Mexico, been to Africa. Poor folk in those countries get skinny because they poor. They're so poor, they can't even afford the last OR. They poor. Huh? And they're losing weight. In America, oh, I ain't got no money. Oh, you ain't got no money because you got about 100 pounds? Hello, somebody. Well, I'm saying this to, be, to, to bring it home. Well, listen, we have nothing to complain about in this country. Not one of us. Huh? We are a blessed people. So just the fact that we live in this country, that God, for whatever reason, chose to bless, we should praise him. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Man, I live in this country. Praise the Lord. That's enough. I can wake up every morning. Praise him. Thank you, Jesus. Because uh, you could have been born in India. Well. That's rugged. You could have been born in the shiny towns. Fernando Sinem, Cape Town. That's brutal. You're born in America. God blessed country. So we have something to praise him about. Now, let's put that aside now. Listen, you're not going to hell. Oh, okay, maybe that means nothing to you. Let me say that again. This side didn't hear me. Can you hear me over here? Listen, you're not going to hell. Because you deserve that. You know that, right? The only thing we deserve is hell. And God in his grace and his mercy says, no, you're not going to go to hell. I, that's why I sent my son. Because he did not create hell for us. Listen, when you look at the Bible, hell was created for the devil and all his demons. He made that lake of fire specifically for Satan and his demons. What has happened, the Bible says that hell is enlarging itself. Why? Because people reject Christ. Everybody in hell is not sent there. Everybody in hell is a volunteer. They volunteer for it. Because he has made so many ways to get away from that. He's, he's given so much opportunity not to go there. Yet, despite every route, every church, everybody who's preaching the gospel, there are many, perhaps millions, who insist on going to hell. See, I have a reason to praise. But I ain't going there. Amen? Amen? I'm not going there. You're not going there. See, today our, is a sacrifice of praise, and the Bible says it should be continual, not just a set time Sunday morning at 11. In the good times, and even the tough times, Job says, shall I praise him only in the good and not the bad? He tells his wife after his wife said, curse God and die. He goes, no, I will not. If we fail to give thanks to God, the Bible says that even the rocks will cry out. And I am not going to let no rock out praise me. Huh? So in Romans 1 21, you read about a people, and Paul, what an amazing story. He says there, even though they knew God, this is heavy, even though they knew God, that, they knew God. Even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. 
But they, he came, look, look, look what happens. When you fail to, to give him honor, when you fail to give him thanks, and you know God, look what happens. Paul is talking to the Roman church, New Testament, under Christ. But they became futile in their speculation. They became foolish, and their heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. So that's the danger of not praising God, especially when you know him. The sin of not praising God leads to two dangerous snares. Fut futility in your speculation, in your thinking. Pastor Steve would always call it stinking thinking. Or you get a foolish heart. You begin to speculate. I was talking to with a young man last, uh, last night, and he began to say, well, I believe there are many demagogues. I felt like, oh, really? Demagogues. Wow, where did you get that? You were watching Star Wars? It just, it just created, it popped in his mind. No, no, no reason for it, no rhyme, no anything. It just popped, and he began to create his own little philosophy. Oh, how wonderful. And others believe that they are reincarnated. I will die and come back as a butterfly to fly amongst, you know. Where do they come up with these ideas? Huh? Too much LSD? I don't know what they're doing. Huh? But that's what happens. When you begin, when you know God, you know, and you don't praise Him, you begin to create illusions in your brain, futile in your speculations. Hmm? Genesis 6, 5, and I'm coming in for landing. It reads, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only on evil all the time. Now, check this out. The Lord was grieved they had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. That's the only time we find where God says, I'm sorry I made man. Because all they wanted to think about was evil and evil and evil. Huh? See, Paul, in, in Ephesians chapter 4, speaking to the Gentile church, says, look, you shouldn't live any longer like, like, like you used to, being futile in your thinking. In essence, Paul is saying there in Ephesians 4, 17, that, that you don't think like the world anymore. The material, the scene, those of us who know about God and have a great way of spiritualizing Worldly wealth and well-being. Let's not get caught up in, in trying to be like the world. We're not called to be like the world. We're called to be like Jesus. Now there are times we have different methods of evangelism. And that's one to do a method of evangelism. But when you become that, wait a minute. We're not called to be like, 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 like the world. We're called to be like Jesus. Uh, we have to move on. Because if you, if you get caught up in that, it'll draw you in. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. Be careful. You know, be very careful. And the second thing, as I am, I'm at the runway now. Let me ask my piano player to come forward. As they were foolish in heart. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 reads, Keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it spring the issues of life. What a great scripture. And the new um, century version it reads like this. Be careful what you think. Because your thoughts run your life. Isn't that so true? And that's what happens when you're foolish of heart. Because out of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know what's in there? Eventually going to come out. Eventually. That's why, you know, I, I, I'm not going to pick on the home, but I like the home because it's, the home is like a, a pressure cooker. The church is like a crock pot. It is. See, the church, you come in, we don't, we don't get to know you. you. You have to be in the church a long time for us to really get to know you because we don't spend enough time with each other. You're a crock pot. So you're like, you know, a piece of roast sitting there and you're cooking. Eventually, we'll know who you are, correct? Things will happen and we're going to figure out who you are. Somebody's going to get in your grill, and we're going to know who you are. Somebody's going to cross your path, and we're going to say, oh, oh, we, oh, oh, oh there he is. Oh, there, that's how she, oh, hi, sister. We did Nice to meet you. And you may have been in church a long time because, you know, we're just slow. 
right? And some people like this, it's okay. But I like the home. They're a pressure cooker. It, what, what the home learns in a year, it takes the church people four to six years to learn. Because they're under, under pressure. So they come in all nicey nice. Hi, Pastor. They look like, you know, like they couldn't break a dish. Shaking hand. Because they're, 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 you know, supposed to try, trying to be respectful, and that's good. And, but that's all right, because they're under pressure. Six months down the road, the, the, we'll get to know them. Then we'll say, oh, that's why you're in the home. Because they're not in the home because they're good people. Sorry, guys. I mean, they're not in the home because, like, they're, 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 they're superstars, and, and they're going to be president one day. Although they might, they don't have too many felonies, you might become president. They're there because they were up to stuff. And they're under pressure. And eventually we get to know them. And see, that's a good thing. Because once they get cooked, we can deal with it. And God can deal with it. Because it's those people who fail to recognize who they are, fail to change. That's why a guy's in the home, and I say this on the other side, that's why 80% of all the pastors in Victor Outreach are men's home graduates. Why? Because they figure out that the jig is up, I can't fake these dudes. I can't lie. I can't be a fake or a fraud or a full-time broad, so I better just be for real. And then we can help them. And then they get help, and they begin to praise God. Then they become grateful, and guess what? They want to help others. That's, what, that's how it happens. That's, that, that's the method of VO. 80% of our ministers. Uh, why? Because they were under the pressure. Now they were, they were dealing with the issues, getting back to here, of their heart. Now, does it have to be that way? No. As long as you are honest with yourself and deal with the issues of your heart, God can use you. God can raise you up. What are the issues of life? Your salvation, the Bible says, I'm, I'm really going to land, I'm sorry. The Bible says that, that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That's an issue of your heart. The Bible speaks about your marriage. Hello, if you're married, you have to work out. These are issues of your life. How are you handling that? Huh? How are you handling your, your relationship with your children, your family? Issues of life. And I tell you, I don't care how bad it is. Because when I got, came to the Lord and I was saved, I didn't understand. I didn't have any children, 25. Within five years, I went from zero children to five. I, but I didn't know what I was doing, man. I didn't. You know, I, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I just couldn't help it. My wife couldn't keep her hands off me. I can say that because she's not here. And then I go, like, what am I doing? I had no idea. But I did know this. And I told my wife this. I, I really don't know how to be married. I have no idea how to be a dad. But I do know this. And I'm going to praise God the rest of my life. Yeah. I know if I keep doing this because I trust him, he's going to help me. He's going to help me figure it out. And we had been married five, six, seven years already. I go, Debbie, I'm sorry. I just don't get it, man. I'm trying the best I can. Every time I do it, I mess it up. But I, I promise you this. I will serve God all my life. And I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. That's how much I believe in praise and worshiping God. And how much it could do for you. And how it can change your life. Because I was lost. Oh, I had some education. I came up. But I didn't understand it. Didn't get it. Grab a hold of it. And I was willing to admit it to my wife. I don't get it. I need help. Huh? See, these are the issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it spring the issues of life. So as we do that, our, our praise not only is continual, we begin to sacrifice. We sacrifice to God and our time, our talents, our treasure. Why? Because we're, we're grateful. I'm grateful. That's why I do what I do and, and work and, and stay up late and get up early and do other things all week long. Trying to, to set things up for the church, for the home. For everything. Why? Because I'm grateful. 
I'm grateful for God, what God did for me. And lastly, not only is this sacrificial, but it should be audible. Huh? Use your mouth. You cannot praise God silently. You know, I remember there was a guy um, back in Hayward, Pastor Quillen. He was a, uh, one of those guys from the Church of God in Christ, like a oh, southern, southern guy from, I think he was from southern Indiana. Has an old little southern type of rock in it. I don't care what you came to do, but I came to praise the Lord. I go, oh, I like that song. Little blues, little, little, little boogie woogie on that. Right? I said, yeah, that's what I, I came to praise the Lord. I don't care what Steve came to do. I don't care if Fernando's mad. I don't care if anybody's mad, but I know what I came to do. I came to praise the Lord. That's all I come to church for. Why? Because I am grateful. I don't care what I'm going through. I got my car's flat. Huh, my dog bit me. I don't care what you came to do I came to praise the Lord and that's all I ever do yes. listen the week is tough why wouldn't you want to come and shout and, and let some of this off you know what I mean get, you know, get some of that tension out of you yeah. praise God that's how you do it praise him like you mean it Hebrews 13 15 says though through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of of lips that give thanks to his name. Singing, praising, shouting, confession, testimonies. Every one of us have something to say about Jesus. Every one of us. See, if we come into his presence, the sacrifice you and I bring to him is not of animals. Huh? When, when you come to Victory Outreach, be ready to sing. Can I say that again? When you come to Victory Outreach, be ready to sing. Uh, we do our best to keep the words, and we know sometimes they lag, but it's all right. Just keep up. Memorize them. Huh? Come to sing. Sing in not just a preliminary service, but praise is something that, that we enter into. Huh? A preacher can tell when people are into it, and they're singing and praising. You can feel it. Boom. Okay. It's gone. Thank you, Jesus. The people are here. The people are praising. They're breaking down. They're, they're battling right now. They're helping me out. Because when you praise and worship, you help me. The preacher out right here. You're helping because you're getting me through. You're getting me to, into connection. You're able, enabling me to be able to grab a hold of the hem of Jesus Christ for power. So as the psalmist said, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. As every his body, every eye closed. This morning. What I'm going to do, I'm not going to make an altar call. We're going to praise the Lord. You gonna, give me a song, a praise song, something crazy. Huh? I don't know. Give me something. We're going to praise God. I want everybody to stand. Steve's a teacher. He knows the best way to bring something into your heart about teaching is not just to hear about it. It's to apply it as soon as possible. Amen? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to apply it right now. What song, what, what song are we doing? Huh? Come on. He's a mighty God? All right. Listen, listen now, you got to understand, Victor Harris, when we praise, we like getting funky. Is that Okay. Because that's just our style. Amen. Everybody got their style. Go ahead.